Hello lovely people, welcome to my traditional birthday chat video. This is a tradition I've been doing for maybe as long as I've had my YouTube channel actually now I think about it, where when my birthday comes I literally just sit and have a little chat to you. The rest of the year my channel is all books, 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 um, and this is just sort of like the time where I just tell you more about my life. What I've been up to, how the year has been. I have thoroughly enjoyed the first year of my 30s. Being 30 has been brilliant. I've had such a good year. To briefly cover reading, and then I'll just go into like my life, um, I would say that 2024, if I'm viewing this as like a mid year check in point, um, it's been a great year for reading. I have already hit my 100 books reading goal, so everything else is just a bonus from here on out. I still have my pages goal on uh, Storygraph, haven't hit that yet, so we are still working towards something, but everything else is a bonus. Um, my reading has definitely this year shifted towards non-fiction. I think I've said in the last few years that it's usually like a third of my reading is non-fiction, two thirds fiction, whereas it's been pretty solidly 50-50 this whole year. And I think that that reflects some of the things in my life that I'm going to talk about. Like specifically, I have been ravenous for art books this year. And I'm about to tell you all about all the arty things I've been doing. So there's a definite correlation there. Um, also history books. I think as well, because I've been doing a few going to book talks and um, I went to Gloucester History Festival in September and then again in April and that was really inspiring like listening to historians tell you about research that is like changing the game and all of that like is so interesting and then individual book talks by um, Natalie Haynes, Yanina Ramirez and Bethany Hughes. That's all been super fascinating. I definitely want to go to more book talks because um, I used to, when I was a kid, I would like, when I was literally like a teenager, I would take myself off to like Bath Children's Festival and all that kind of thing and just go to talks on my own. I don't know why I've stopped doing it. I think because it's been hard. I don't drive. So where I live is slightly hard to get places with the public transport available. So I think that's probably why. But new resolutions go to more inspiring booky talk things um speaking of going to things i'll just shall I, i'll just tell you what we're doing for my birthday i'm such a little leo <laughs> i kind of like my mum. i was talking to my mum actually because she was like oh wow i should really drop your present around before your birthday because we're not seeing you until like the week after and i was like no no this is by design i like to spread my birthday out for as long as possible um so i refer to july as so fest <laughs> in in lockdown actually my partner made me like a fake little festival armband that was so fest the, the family are all on board um and i just like to make it's the same with my july tbr i was like i like to plan five star reads i kind of like to do the same with with just life for july and then into august a bit because my partner's birthday is early august so we kind of do lots of joint things um, so, so fest is well and truly underway. The second weekend of July is where I feel it all kicked off because I did Bristol Pride, which I have done for many years. One of the first videos on my channel is my vlog of my first ever Bristol Pride, which was nine years ago. I worked it out because uh, I've been out for a decade, but it's nine years since my first Bristol Pride. Um, I'll link that below if you want to see baby Sophie. <laughs> Um, but it's it's grown so much since that then. It was such a smaller event at that point. It was their 15 year anniversary this year. Um, the thing I love about Bristol Pride is that they very deliberately keep it so that you as just a general person can march, you can be part of the parade. It's not as corporate as a lot of the other prides have become. Um, like, for example, I love Manchester Pride. I've done Manchester Pride a few times. But you can you can only be in the parade if you're, like, a corporation or, or, you know, there are good things that are there. There's charities, there's all this kind of thing. They're not, like, inherently evil. But you as just a general person stand and watch it. Whereas with Bristol, it's very specifically a core part of 
Pride's ethos that uh, you march in it and it's a community march and it always feels so special to me. I always try and do the march because it, it just makes me feel so affirmed. Um, I meant to take videos. I was like, oh, I'll do another mini Pride vlog. That didn't go very well. Um, here is a picture of what I looked like in the march. I made my little sign that said bisexuals for trans rights because I'm really angry with specific actions of people like Wes Streeting at the moment and I wanted to make it explicitly clear. I'm really sick and tired of groups like LGB without the T speaking on behalf of me. Um, so I just wanted to make it explicitly clear that this is trans support coming from a bisexual, coming from the community, and that the community stands together. That's very important to me. And another thing I will say about Bristol Pride is it's really explicitly trans inclusive, and there is so much support for the trans community there. It's wonderful. Um, this is what I look like. <laughs> so that was that. I had meant to record. I got distracted. I had too much of a lovely time. The only clip that I took was this 10 second clip of Claire from Steps singing Tragedy. That was it. I had too much of a good time for the rest of the day, but it was wonderful. I felt deeply affirmed. And then the the next weekend, which is the weekend that I'm actually recording this ahead of my birthday, um, I've just come back from Fantasy Forest, which is a uh, fantasy themed festival, but it's not just fantasy. It also encapsulates sci-fi and uh, anime. Essentially, it's this massive festival in the grounds of Sudley Castle. And it has lots of different zones. So there's like a steampunk zone. There's this year was there was the wastes, which is very like Mad Max inspired. There's loads of stages that have like music and other things. So there's like the dragon stage, the dream stage, all this. There's competitions throughout the day. So there's costume competitions. There's body painting competitions. There's loads of different performers. Um, there's like in the medieval zone. There's like knights hitting each other with swords. In the steampunk zone, there's like. Uh, teapot racing there's like so much happening it's so good there's food the people camp it is just wonderful i went as just a little fairy this time again here's me at fantasy forest this is what i look like i was going to record things and all i got was this clip of knights hitting each other with swords <laughs> And then this clip of the some of the steampunk vehicles. I was too busy having a good time again, which is never a problem. I don't really know that many people in my real life. Like I have, I feel the need to clarify, I have friends. <laughs> They're just not really into this kind of thing. And I would love to know uh, if there's any other events because I'd really like to make some friends that like to do this kind of thing so that I could have more of a group. Like my partner came with me and we had a great time, but I just really like to her befriend some people i don't know and then for my actual birthday i think i'm going to go frolic around a national trust property probably because they have secondhand bookshops and lovely history and gardens and that kind of thing and that's kind of the mood i'm in so i think that's what i'm going to be doing on the day that this goes live i don't know and then for the rest of my weekends i have lots of things booked in with like seeing family seeing friends that kind of stuff so lovely lovely celebratory times um I also wanted to, in this video, talk through some of the arty things I've been doing. I keep looking down here because I've got my little stack. Um, so essentially, one of the reasons why I have been in such an art book mood this year is um, that I started the year by doing loads of workshops. So my mum is very artistic. She grew up um, making her own clothes, like very much. That was obviously something that my mum's generation of people did more because you just learned to sew and you made clothes and you adjusted clothes and all that kind of thing. But she's been really getting back into it. Um, 
Unfortunately, she was made redundant at the end of last year. We found out at Christmas and it just so happened to work perfectly timing wise because literally the week she was made redundant was the week we did our first workshop together. And then the final RT event that we did together was the same week as the week that she got a new job. So we kind of managed to sort of um, take her through that difficult time by doing loads of lovely, inspiring things, uh, which worked out really well because we bought each other these things as like Christmas presents and then birthday presents. I bought it for her for her birthday and all that kind of thing. So I'm going to tell you about all the things I did. It's been so inspiring. I've had the best time. If you're not interested in crafts, I completely understand. Uh, thank you for watching. I'm going to babble for a bit. I'll link to all the people that I did these workshops with down in the description because they were all fabulous. They were great teachers across the board. So if you're interested in any of these, do check them out if you particularly live in the greater southwest area. Um, the first workshop I did was Shibori. Shibori is a Japanese um, technique. It's effectively like a resistance dye technique, but um, there's there's kind of two different types of shibori. So I believe the where the actual word comes from is from the type which involves folding in geometric patterns um, and then clamping and then dyeing. But there's also a technique that involves stitching in. Um, I learned shibori when I did textiles at A level. Um, but we did it, I realised, you know how like teachers adapt things for kids? I realised this technique that we learned was like a much simpler version where we put objects into fabric, held it with elastic bands and then like steamed it. So it dyed and it did the resistant dye, but you didn't have to do the actual difficult like sewing technique side of it. Um, having now learned more about shibori it is incredible the the master shibori artists like the level how they even make their stitches so tiny is wild to me i'm going to put some examples up here of my new favorite shibori artist um ichigo kabuto i think his name is i'm so sorry i can't remember off the top of my head but i'll have written it along here if i got that wrong um just absolutely incredible so what we did was this is the sort of um, clamping technique piece that I did which I think with hindsight I don't think I really understood how it how the resistance would work on it and I if I did this again I have a much better idea of how I would fold it because I don't think I got I don't think I left enough space for the the indigo I, it's too white for my preference this is an example of the piece I did which was um stitching in circles so you fold it and then you stitch it and again these ones worked out much better so again I know how I would do that better if I did it again and then this piece was just sort of like an experimental stitching to sort of see depending on how you stitched how it would take the colour um, so that was like a fun experimental piece the really cool thing about indigo is that it's an oxidative it's an I can't say that word oxidative guide it oxide <laughs> it reacts to the oxygen so when you dunk it in the indigo vat it comes out looking like this very green and then before your eyes it darkens and then it's the type of dye where you dip it more than once to get a stronger color and that was super fascinating but then the second workshop we did continued the dyeing theme so it was really fun to sort of go from indigo and then the next one I did was natural yarn dyeing so um, it was with this amazing person called Ria who um, very much taught us about the real basics of how regardless of what natural dye you're, you're using the technique core and then we actually did specific things so I have a bunch of skeins of yarn I haven't done anything with these yet because my friend is teaching me to crochet so I eventually kind of have this plan of crocheting a quilt where each granny square is a different type of yarn that I have dyed with natural dye um, but I haven't really succeeded at crocheting yet because, side note, I've been really busy trying to finish up loads of pom-pom wreaths. So I offered to people at work that I would make them pom-pom wreaths for free if they just, like, 
got me a surprise in return because I love a surprise. Um, so I made this pom pom wreath, which is like blues and greens for one of my work friends. I made this one, which is sort of, I'm calling it sort of like a sunset sunrise kind of wreath. And then I made this one, which is like a spring flowers kind of mood. And then I have one more to make, which is very much like Christmassy. It's like reds and greens and that kind of thing. Um, which I need to do, frankly. And then when that's done, then I'm going to fully get my brain into crocheting. But I feel I need to deliver on what I have promised before I can do that. But um, these two are Coreopsis, which is a flower. As you can see, I tried it on different... Um, we all had different types of wool. So I tried to do one light, one dark on each colour so I could see how the colour changes. And even just between these two, like, I'm obsessed with this. This is my favourite. Oh, I got that wrong. This was the other Coreopsis, because it's orange. Madder was this. So this is, like, really red madder. God, for some reason I'm absolutely blanking on what this one was. Brain of a sieve. I'll put this one in the comments. Really interesting one is this was avocado pits, this beautiful little peachy. After that, I did a hand building pottery workshop. So I had previously did for my 30th birthday, I treated myself to a wheel throwing workshop where I made like three little tiny bowls. Um, so for this one, me and my mum did other hand building technique. The first one we did was um, pinch pot. So I made this one, which I need to, it's got all my earrings, my big, big earrings in. Uh, I'm just gonna dip them all out for the purposes of this. Um, so I just did a very simple, like five petal flower. This is very much inspired by uh, Pixie Lock's aesthetic. To be honest with you, I knew that I wanted a pot for my big earrings. And so I wanted to have the sides quite high. So I just went quite simple just to, frankly, from a practicality point of view. I don't think this is my most wonderfully creative piece, but I did actually need something to put big earrings in, so it worked out quite well. My favourite piece that I made was actually my coil pot. Um, this is, I don't know how well you can see, it's like a little coral reef. So I have a little uh, starfish, some little seaweeds, little fish, and I put quite a bit of texture in. I don't think you can see it on the camera very well, but there's lots of texture in that I use like tools to like carve in. Um, I really like doing stuff with texture. I'm not very good at being um, very accurate to life, but I do like playing with colour and texture and that kind of thing. So this is sort of my little coral pot. And then we came to slab building. And the problem with slab building was that I actually, that was the only one I had a clear vision of what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was I was inspired by this piece that my gran made. This is one of my gran's pieces. I think I've talked about her quite a bit on the channel. This is her pond pot. Um, it's got all of these fabulous little frogs and like the pond, the rushes and everything. And what I was really inspired by was this, um, way that she did the tops like I, I wanted to slab build something that was sort of a very small inspired by this with this sort of thing and to be honest with you we ran out of time we got to about 15 minutes before the session was going to end and the person leading it was like oh god I haven't told you how to slab build and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do achieve that in the time and therefore I didn't want to try because I didn't want to get annoyed that my vision wouldn't work so I panicked and I made a coaster <laughs> because time was very tight so I made this little coaster I went very uh flat colors again I don't know if you can see there's quite a lot of texture in there I did loads of wiggles and dots and that kind of thing to be honest with you it's a bit rubbish as a coaster because I also um put my thumb in it <laughs> So it's not entirely flat. It does work. It's just not the best coaster of all time. Uh, but it was a great learning experience. And I had a fun time. Um, I think I would like to try a slab building session again in the future where I can actually just do the vision with more time. Um, the final workshop I did was my favourite. And that was batik. Batik is a Indonesian technique. When you look at proper batik it is stunning and incredible um we did the two color method so it's a wax resist technique you use these little tools called chanting um which is like a little brass um pot that holds the you have like the wooden stem the little brass pot that holds the hot wax and then a little 
shooty bit coming out so you can draw with it. Um, we did the two colour techniques, so you on the silk we paint a colour, a few things to get it solid enough, and then you do the wax and then you paint over it, and then when that is dry, that's when you then do the wax removal and then you have your wax resist. Um, it was wonderful. This is just my little test piece that I did. Again, I think you can't really see it very well in this light. Um, it's much brighter. Yes, this is this is this little face I'm obsessed with. It's from a little Celtic pot that I love. Um, that was my inspiration, is for this one I kind of came prepared and I knew I wanted to do a piece inspired by this pot. This is a Celtiberian pot, very, very old. I'm so interested in Celtiberian. I don't, the Celtiberian writing script specifically, but also these pots in general, I think they have some really cool motifs. Um, so for this one, I took inspiration from that pot and I did this piece. Again, can't really see it very well in this lighting, but this is the Celtiberian script that is on that pot. I copied it. Um, and then this is the heart and everything that is also on the pot. So I loved this. This was my my favourite one because I felt like I had a really clear vision and I achieved the vision. I realised that I can be quite precise with the chanting tools, which was really fab. Um, and I just had the most wonderful time. I have a lot of ideas for what to do with Batik. I have been... Oh, it's just down here, actually. I've been going through this book, The Grammar of Ornament, by um, Owen Jones, which is a visual, a visual reference of form and colour in architecture and the decorative arts. And it just has, it's like split into different, so this is like the Egyptian section, and it's literally just patterns and motifs of different styles of art. So I have been spending some time sort of treating myself as a child doing mark making where I copy, I'm trying to copy designs and just sort of develop the pencil skills so then I could, for example, try batik again and try and do some of these. It will be interesting trying to adapt some of them into what will work using wax that then, you know, like they have to be simplified to work in that way. But I have all these ideas for what I'm going to do, which is very exciting. I'm just going to take a drink because I've been talking a lot. The final sort of creative thing we did was that we went to a yarn over, which I've never done before. Um, and I picked up some lovely things that I just thought I would show you. Um, I got these two bundles, which are beautiful. It's this person, um, Expertly Dyed Art by Science. They have a YouTube channel. I'll link it down below. Just the most stunningly dyed. I was very drawn to these like warm colour things. So when I have learned to crochet better, I would like to crochet some stuff using this. Uh, but they were stunning. I also got these little bundles. This is from Janet and Bluebell that are um, dyed, well... I know you can use these for weaving. I sort of wonder if I could also use them in some other textile way. I don't quite know, but I was obsessed with these colours specifically, like beautiful clouds. I don't know, just beautiful. And then I also got a bunch of buttons. So I got these buttons that are like imprints of leaves which is wonderful and similarly like flowers but then also this little herb series so this is rosemary uh sage so that kind of thing i won't show you all of them because <laughs> we'll be here all day um but suffice to say i've been having a really wonderful time sort of reconnecting with my creativity i did a lot of textile i mean i did a whole a level in textile arts um what happened is that then you graduate from university, you rent, you move around a lot, you don't have a lot of space. And I just didn't, I didn't see the point in investing lots of money into stuff that takes up a lot of room when I was living in flats that were not very big. <laughs> and I didn't have that much time. Whereas now I'm feeling like embracing this creativity again. Um, it's been a little bit put on pause because I am in the process of trying to buy a house. <laughs> which is intense. I'm really hoping if everything goes well with what we're currently doing, we all will have hopefully moved before the end of this year, which is going to be a big improvement. I do like where we are, but there are some problems with where we are. Uh, just nothing, if nothing else, it's very dark in this house. Very, very dark. And that makes winter a real slog. Um, 
So I'm really hoping that that will go through okay, but that has been taking up a lot of time and energy <laughs> and it's also terrifying. Wow. Um, so if you could all cross your fingers and your toes, that would be very kind. Thank you very much. Hopefully everything will be fine. Um, but yeah, so that's very exciting on the horizon. Uh, very big grown up step, but very excited for it. Is there anything else? <laughs> yeah, otherwise everything else is going really well. Uh, my job is going really well. I still, I'm still working the same job. I do, I don't talk about it much because I like to keep my professional and personal life slightly separate. But I work for a publishing company, um, doing children's magazines, which I find extremely fulfilling. Um, really, really fab. I love it. Um, I'm very busy, but I'm very happy. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm excited for what the future holds. I'm excited for reading more books, doing more lovely things. I've gone to a lot of exhibitions this year that has also been really tapping into the arty thing. I went to uh, Henry Moore in miniature, which was fab. Um, no statue was taller than 30 centimetres. And I also recently went to one which was a um, sort of combination of artists like Toulouse-Lautrec, but also Alphonse Mucha, very much like that period of Paris like the advertising posters that was brilliant so I've been doing lots of like inspiring things that are making me feel wonderful um so yes I should really draw this to a close because this is far longer than the birthday chats normally are but that's just because I had so much to say um I really hope that you are doing well I would really love to if you want to let me know how your life is going what you've been loving like what has been bringing you joy anything like that that would be really like really lovely um, if you have any things that you're like, oh Sophie, I'd really like to see this on your channel, please let me know because I'm always, I'm always open to ideas. I might take a while to do them just because I get busy. <laughs> but you know, um, anything that you want to leave a comment about, please do. I will have a little chat. That'd be nice. Um, but otherwise, in the meantime, I hope you are having the best of times and I will speak to you next time for like we'll be back to normal bookish scheduling and all of that but I hope you have a lovely July I'm sending you lots of love ta-ra